but God's mercy, how thankful are you? If you have your Bibles, go to the book of Psalm 100. Let's take a look at those verses again. Psalm 100, again, quickly. As I mentioned in the opening that next week, you know, I'm going to consider next week sort of a Thanksgiving type of atmosphere still since we have Thanksgiving on Friday. Okay, seeing if you're awake. Okay, Thursday. That, and since this is a psalm of thanksgiving in Psalm 100, 1 through 5, I'm going to focus on really the aspect here and then uh, I'll look at something in chapter, in verses 2 and 3 next week. But again, verse 1 says, Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Verse 4, enter into his gates with, what's the word? Thanksgiving. And into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. Now verse 5 tells us why we are to be. For the Lord is good. And his what? His mercy. His mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. And there's many things there, but God impressed my heart today to focus on the mercy part. God's mercy, how thankful are you? In the book, Our Father Cares, it is a compilation of writings of Mrs. White. She says here, on page 185, when... Mercy and loving kindness of God, we shall. Now, I haven't shown you that yet. She says that when we, God's people, have a deeper appreciation for God's what? Mercy, what shall happen? Okay. She says we shall praise him. Instead of complaining, amen? I know you were hesitant with that amen. (laughs) When we have a deeper appreciation for God's mercy and loving kindness, we shall praise him instead of complaining. We shall talk of the loving watch care of the Lord, of the tender compassion of the God of a good shepherd. The language of the heart will not be selfish, murmuring, and ripening. Praise like a clear flowing stream will come from God's truly believing ones. Can you say amen? There is a false theory out there that says that the God of the Old Testament is not as merciful as the God of the New Testament. There is a myth out there that the God of the Old Testament is not as loving and caring and compassionate and merciful and all these things. They claim that, oh, the God of the Old Testament is a God of of, of anger and uh, strictness and legalism and, and not of love. And the God of the New Testament is someone different. He is just opposite that is false. The God of the Old Testament is just as merciful compassionate and loving as the God of the New Testament because it's the same God. For the Bible says God never changes. Amen. And some will read some things in the Bible that they might think is contradictive or they might not like and they begin to claim that maybe, you know, God's word is not accurate as some claim, but I want to go on record today to say that if you might find a quote-unquote discrepancy in the Word of God, it's not God's fault or the Word's fault, it is our fault. In our sinful, finite minds, we might not comprehend maybe the fullness that God has there, but nothing is ever in regards to misunderstandings God's fault. God's Word is clear, amen. Amen. Listen to what I'm going to say next. God's mercy towards sinners is so beyond comprehension 
that I might even suggest even beyond our own comfort level. Let's say it again. God's mercy towards sinners is so beyond comprehension that his mercy might even go beyond our comfort level. Today we're going to study God's mercy and then I'm going to leave you with a challenge. The Bible says here, it's on the screen, that the Lord passed before him and proclaimed. This is when Moses was on top of Mount Sinai and God was proclaiming the very character of God. The Lord, the Lord God, what's the word? Merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands and forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. Now, in the New King James, this word mercy appears how many times? How many times here? Yeah. You're going to have to wake up. It's not sleep time. How many times does the word mercy appear here in this? Twice. Now, the Hebrew words are actually different Hebrew words here. The word here that is translated merciful is more connected with compassion. And the other one is more connected with kindness and goodness. So the word merciful here, mercy, is connected with compassion and goodness and kindness. Are you with me? The Bible says in Ephesians, but God who is rich in, what's the word? In mercy, because of his great love, with which he loved us. And the Greek word there, loved, is in the continuous. In other words, it never stops. So mercy is connected with compassion and kindness and goodness. Mercy is connected with love. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4, let us therefore come boldly before the throne of grace that we may obtain, what do we need? Mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now look at this one here in Psalm. For you, Lord, are good and ready to, what's the word? Forgive and abundant in mercy to all those who call upon you. So here in this verse we see that forgiveness is connected with what? That's right. Forgiveness and mercy are connected just as they are connected with kindness and goodness and compassion and love. God truly is merciful. And you're going to say amen because that's what you should do. But I'm going to share with you that God is willing to forgive any degree of sin because of his abundance of mercy. Go to John 19. We're going to see that there are degrees of sin. There are degrees of sin. Now, I hope to be clear here in my next few words because I don't want no one to misinterpret what I'm going to be saying, but I want to show you first that there are different degrees of sin according to the Bible. John 19, John 19, who can beat me there? I said that when I was already there, so I knew that I would win. John 19, verse 11. Say amen when you get there. Christ is before Pilate. And Jesus says in verse 11, Jesus answered, You could have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me, who, who betrayed Jesus? Judas. To you has the the greater sin. There are different degrees of sin. Now, I want to give now a parenthetical statement. Sin is sin. Can you say amen? Regardless of degree, okay, like lying is a different degree than like 
murder, right? These are different degrees of sin here. Are you understanding, okay? But I want to say that regardless of the degree, sin is sin. Sin separates us from God and brings suffering, pain, and death. I want to make that crystal clear. Regardless of the degree of sin, sin is offensive to God, lying or anything else. Amen. And the wages of sin, regardless of degree, is death. Okay? Now, are you clear with that? Yes? Okay. In the book, Patriarchs and Prophets, we are told this, Ellen White says, had some great test been appointed Adam, then those whose hearts inclined to evil would have excused themselves by saying, oh, this is a trivial matter, and God is not so particular about little things. And there would be continual transgression in things looked upon as small, which pass unrebuked among men, but the Lord has made it evident that sin in any degree is offensive to him. Are you with me? So I'm not here excusing sin what's at all. Are you understanding? I'm just revealing that there are different degrees of sin. Some people have fallen lower than others. Can you say amen? That's true. Some people have fallen a lot lower than others. The thing is, is, is God just as merciful to those who have fallen lower than others? Even if the degree of sin is almost understandable, un- un- misunderstood, like, uh, even when the degree of sin is like, no way, would God still be just as merciful to them if they repented and forgiven to those who didn't have that same degree? No matter the degree of sin, here's my point. Again, I'm not excusing sin. Sin is sin regardless of the degree, but here's my point. No matter the degree of sin, God is able and willing to forgive if confessed and repented. Because I said, some people have fallen lower than others. Are you understanding? Therefore, if you have fallen to the very bottom in regard to the degree of sin, Would it be hopeless for you if you came to a moment in your life where you have truly confessed and repented? Or is God even as merciful to them no matter? How thankful. Because you know what? My righteous sin isn't better than anybody else's. (laughs) So let's look at some stories here quickly. In the Bible it says that there was a man brought by his friends and they dug a hole where? in the roof, and the Bible says that they lowered this man to see who? Jesus. The Bible does not really give us the degree of sin by this man. It just, you know, Jesus says his sins were forgiven, and then he healed him. We don't know the exact sins there, but I mean, we we, we can probably, you know, hazard a guess that it wasn't any degree very grievous, right? It wasn't like, it just seems like he was a sinner, and God forgave him knowing his heart of confession and repentance. Are you understanding? Okay. Now we come to another story in regards to the degree that some have fallen more than others. And we have this story of a woman who was caught in adultery. Now, we know the degree that she had sinned. And the Bible says that when she was brought before Jesus, and Christ, of course, knew the heart that she was embarrassed and humble, repentive, the Bible says that Jesus wrote on the ground and said, he who, what, has no sin, cast the first, and the Bible says that of course Jesus eventually forgave her and said, go sin no more, can you say amen? Now we come to this man, who do you think this is? He's looking out from his kingdom and he sees a young lady bathing. Who is this? That's right, King David. And the Bible says that in his degree of sin and his fallen, that he sees a woman. What's her name? Bathsheba, and she was bathing. And what did King David do? He said, bring her to me. 
and he had it, committed adultery and fornication, and then, didn't just end there, the degree of sin went even lower. Then he got her husband, what's his name? Uriah killed, right? I mean, it's like the degrees here are, are, are sort of lowering. Are you with me? Now, here's the thing. Did David repent and ask for forgiveness? Did he truly repent? Was he forgiven? Now, I said, now I said that the mercy, how how great God's mercy is it might even be beyond our comfort level. Because some people have fallen lower than others. But does God's mercy even extend to the very bottom depths of the degree of sin for those who truly come to repentance and forgiveness? But now, We're gonna look at a character in the Bible that the degree of his sin is truly horrendous. If I were to say the name Manasseh, does anybody know who he is? Manasseh, that's right, was Hezekiah's son. He was the 14th ruler and king of Judah and he reigned 55 years. Now, we're going to see here quickly that he was cruel, idolatrous, licentious, and was more wicked than any of his predecessors. If you have your Bible, go to 2 Kings. Let's take a look. How how deep does God's mercy extend to those who truly repent and confess? My question is, how thankful are you for God's mercy? 2 Kings, and, and because usually I like to help and I like to say that if you don't or can't find 2 Kings, it's after 1 Kings. <laughs> 2 Kings chapter 21. Just say amen when you get there. In the Thanksgiving Psalm of 100, it says that God's mercy is everlasting. God's mercy is connected with kindness and love and compassion, forgiveness. How far deep does God's mercy extend in regards to the degree of sin? In 2 Kings, beginning in verse 1, here we go. Let's take a look at Manasseh. Are we there? And the Bible says Manasseh was how old? Twelve. Twelve years old when he became king and he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was? Okay, I'll take your word, verse two. (laughs) Let me just give a parenthetical statement. When I'm giving a Bible study, and I come to a place in the Bible study where I know there are some serious difficult names, I'll say, hey, can you take these verses? And then they'll, they'll suffer through it, and I'll say, well, I'll take it from here, thank you. And then I'll just sort of keep going. That's a little Bible, Bible study instructor trick, right? You, when you know it's coming, let them struggle with it, and then just take over when, they, when they're done. They usually like it. They like it. Verse 3. Uh, verse 2. And he did, what's the word? Evil in the sight of the Lord, according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. For he rebuilt the high places, which Hezekiah his father had destroyed. So that can't be a good thing. And he raised up altars for Baal and made a wooden image as Ahab, king of Israel, had done. Do you know Ahab? How wicked was he? Very wicked. It seems like Manasseh might have been beyond him. And he worshipped all the host of heaven and did what? Serve them. Now listen carefully. What does it mean that he established high places? Well, the high places were a place of sacrifice to the gods. And many a times, what they would sacrifice there was not just animals, but people. Virgins were taken to be sacrificed there, among many others. 
and he set up these high places. And then it says that he set up altars to Baal. Who? Well, what does that mean? Look at the screen here, Jeremiah 19.5. They have also built a high places of who? Of Baal to burn their sons with fire for burnt offerings to Baal, for which I did not command or speak, nor did I come into my mind, God said. So when it says that he built altars to Baal, what it's saying is that they would sacrifice their own children. Now, I don't want to get graphic here, friends, but let me show you how this worked. What happened is, many times, it would be a metal image made with his huge hands like this. And they would light fire underneath this metal god. What happens when metal gets with fire? What happens to the metal? Yeah, it's almost like a stove. Are you with me? And they would sacrifice their children by placing them on the hands of this god. Hideous. Manasseh did more evil. Not only did he set up the high places where many a people were sacrificed to these gods, and then he made up altar to Baal where they were sacrificed their own children. And God says, What what is uh, this never even entered my mind? Can you say amen? The degree of sin here is horrendous. Let's keep going. It also said that he, would worship, he worshiped the host of heaven, which would be the stars and the sun and all these things. Go to verse four now. He also built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord had said in Jerusalem, I will put my name, verse five. And he built altars for all the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. So it's not just something to set up altars somewhere in the high places or anywhere else, but then he brought these idols into God's house. Which is a complete slap in the face to God. Manasseh. How's this guy looking? Gets worse. Look at verse six and seven. He even set a carved image of Asherah that he had made in the house which the Lord had set to David and to Solomon his son, in this house in Jerusalem which I have chosen out of the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. I didn't read verse six, I'm sorry. Verse six, he also made, look at this, his sons pass through the fire. We've already looked at this. And then he practiced soothsaying, used witchcraft, and consulted spiritists and mediums. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. And let me ask you a question, saints. What was God's command for the people to deal with the witchcrafts and the soothsayers and the mediums and the sorcerers? They were, starts with an F, forbidden. And you and I know that the Bible teaches that the dead know nothing and are asleep in the grave. Can you say amen? Therefore, if you are mingling with the witchcrafts and the mediums, a medium is one who is a mediator between you and the dead there. If you are dealing with these, with these, these witchcrafts and soothsayers and mediums, you're dealing with who himself directly? The enemy. Uh. If I was you, I would stay away with anything that deals with sorcery, witchcraft, or any of that. Can you say amen? I was in New Orleans, and I went, my wife and family and some friends, we went to the French Quarter during the day. There's a beautiful, huge um, Catholic church there, quite astounding. And if you've ever been to the French Quarter, you've got the Mississippi River that runs out, of course, into the bay. And then a lot of artists who paint, a lot of things are happening there in the gist of the French Quarter. It's a very nice place, a lot of places to eat there. 
And a lot of those things that are happening there as you're walking is that many will say, come and let me read your palms or let me have, or I can show you the cards. And this very young couple, it almost looked like they just got married, it, it seems like, and they, they, they went there and they paid this, we saw them sit down there and they wanted to, wanted this, to read the cards in regards to what their life, their life was showing. I thought to myself, oh, please, this is the wrong place to be. Can you say amen? Things here that God strictly forbid. Trust me, friends, you're not inviting the right spirit into that place. Are you with me? So this man, Manasseh, is even getting himself to a point where he is directly getting influenced by Satan himself. The degree of sin here is reaching pretty low. Can you say amen? We're almost through here. Go to verse 7 through 12. Take a look at this. I just read 7, did I not? Yeah, he even made card Im- images of Asherah. Okay, verse 8, and I will make the feet of Israel wander any more from the land which I gave their fathers, only if they are careful to do according to all that I have commanded them and according to all the law that my servant Moses commanded them. But they did not, but they paid no, what's the word? Attention. And Manasseh seduced them to do more evil in the nation whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. Now listen carefully. There's one thing for you to sin and then it takes it to another level when you get others to sin. It's one thing for you to choose to do wrong. But man, it takes it to a higher level when you begin to make others do wrong. Are you with me? Continues. Quite a list. Verse 10, and the Lord spoke to his servants, the who? The prophets saying, because Manasseh, the king of Judah, has done these abominations, he has acted more wickedly than all the Amorites who are before him and has also made Judah sin with his idols. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel, behold, I am bringing such calamity upon Jerusalem and Judah that whoever hears of it, both his ears will tingle. And in Jewish tradition, and Mrs. White affirms this, the prophet Isaiah, you know the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah was murdered under the rulership of Manasseh. God's great prophet Isaiah was killed during Manasseh's reign. Surely, this man's degree of sins has reached so low that not even God's mercy could reach. Now, I told you again, that I'm claiming that even God's mercy can be, beyond, can be beyond our comfort level. But you should be thankful for how merciful God is. Let's take a look what happened to Manasseh. Go to verse 16, and it says, Moreover, Manasseh shed very mi- more, m- uh, much innocent blood till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to another, That's a lot of killing. Besides his sin, by which he made Judah sin, and doing evil in the sight of the Lord, now the rest of the acts of Manasseh are that he did, and the sin that he committed, were they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? So Manasseh rested with his fathers and was buried in the garden of his own house, in the garden of Usa. Then his son Ammon reigned in his place. Now I want to say this. I'm so thankful that we have Second Chronicles because if you were just to read Second Kings, it would never tell you how the life of Manasseh ended. But if you have your Bibles, go to Second Chronicles. The story is also mentioned here, and let's see what First Kings does not give us. So go to Second Chronicles, and before I give you the chapter, let me get there first. Second Chronicles, go to chapter 33. 
Okay, so if you're in the Kings, keep going. Two books to the right, and you're going to come to 2 Chronicles. Okay, pass first. Come to 2 Chronicles, chapter 33. Say amen when you get there. Again, the life of Manasseh is repeated here. We just read it, so we're going to get to the end. So let me just read you verse 1 to show you that we're talking about the same character. Verse 33, chapter 33, verse 1 says, what's his name? Manasseh was how many years old? 12 years old when he became king and he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. And again, it recaps the good old life of Manasseh. We now come to verse 10. Say amen when you get there. And the Lord spoke to Manasseh and his people, but they would not listen. Therefore, the Lord brought upon them the captains of the army of the king of Assyria who took Manasseh with hooks. That usually means that they would hook them here in the nose. And they would take them. Either you can walk nicely or you can resist and know what would happen. And he was taken captive back to Assyria. You do know that sometimes when we're just so stubborn and stiff-necked, God has to allow some things to wake us up. And that's because of God's mercy. Amen? I think Manasseh needed a a few quote-unquote slaps on the face. Right? And he's taken captive to Assyria And let's see what happens to Manasseh's heart here. Take a look. We're now in verse 12. Now when he was in affliction, he, Manasseh, implored the Lord his God. And what happened? Verse 12, what happened? He humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers and prayed to him. Let me paraphrase that. He was humbled and repentant. Truly truly repentant. I'm going to show you that there's always fruits to true repentance. Can you say amen? And he called out to God. But there's no way that God's mercy could even extend as far as Manasseh has fallen, do you? The degree of sin this man has, there's no way that if he truly, truly in his heart of hearts said, Lord, I, I truly have messed up. Forgive me. Help me repent. There is no way way that God's mercy could even extend this low, do you think? Look what God does. Verse 13, and pray to him. And what does the Bible say? And God received his entreaty. In other words, God forgave him. I mean, didn't I say that God's mercy can even go beyond our comfort level? I think I want to encourage the discouraged and bring hope to the hopeless. Sin is sin. Can you say amen? God's mercy is not a license to sin. Oh, I know God's merciful, therefore I can just, you know, he'll, he'll forgive. No, that's not, because if you're truly repentant, that's not the attitude you'll have. God's mercy is so merciful, so merci- merciful, that it can even extend down the depths to the degrees of sin that Manasseh had when he truly, with his heart of hearts, humbled himself and repented. God truly is merciful and it definitely less everlasting. Look at 
Let's finish this up. So what, what is true repentance here? Repentance is being sorry and hurtful for what you've done wrong and then turning from that and turning to God. Can you say amen? And then if there's true repentance, there's fruits that follow. Let's see the fruits of Manasseh if he truly repented. Here we go. Let's read now verse 14. Say amen if you're there. After this, he, Manasseh, built a wall outside the city of David on the west side of Gihon in the valley as far as the entrance of the fish gate. And and it enclosed Ophel, and he raised it to a very great height. Then he put military captains in all the fortified cities of Judah, and he took away the foreign gods. Can you say amen? And he took away the foreign gods. Verse 15, and the idol from the house of the Lord is their fruit. Can you say, man, he, he begins to do away with the idols. He takes it from the house of God. He is truly repentant and his life is showing it. Hallelujah. He took away the foreign gods and the idols from the house of the Lord and all the altars that he built in the mount of the house of the Lord and in Jerusalem and he cast them out of the city. And he put military might there to say, don't let these things come back in. Hallelujah. I'm so thankful for Second Chronicles. Anybody else? Because in Kings it just says that he rested with his fathers, but here we see the heart that Manasseh ended his life with. So I, 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 I might say something that I don't know if you like or not, We're looking to see Manasseh in the kingdom, friends. Are you comfortable with that? Because according to the Bible, it looks like he truly repented. And God desires all to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. How thankful are you for God's mercy? All right, let's finish these verses. I'm in verse 16. So he also repaid, repaired the altar of the Lord, sacrificed peace offerings and burnt thank offerings on it, and commanded Judah to serve the Lord God of Israel. He commanded them to say, hey, we, I was wrong. We have to serve the living God. True repentance here. Verse 17, nevertheless, the people still sacrificed on the high places. Some people, of course, there is consequences. There's consequences to sin. Can you say amen? There is. Though Manasseh repented, there was consequences, friends. Unfortunately, his son never did well. Though his, his son saw the early part of the life of his father, but unfortunately, the latter part never touched his son's heart. And the Bible says, as you continue reading, Manasseh's son was just as evil. And we see here that some people that were led astray into idolatry never came back. They were, uh, unfortunately, there are consequences, but my friends, God is merciful. Can you say amen? There is no degree of sin that if truly repented and confessed, God can't dig you out of. Hallelujah, that God truly is merciful. Truly. God's thanksgiving psalm, enter into his house with joy and thanksgiving. Why wouldn't you when you serve this kind of a God? And we say, God is merciful. Eh, Amen. What's on TV? Maybe we have lost that, regardless of the degree of sin, sin hurts our God but I'm so thankful for his mercy. I hope you are. The story shows the extent of divine mercy, compassion, kindness, goodness, and God's desire for all to repent and be saved.
I don't know about you, but there was a moment in my life. You ever had that besetting sin that, man, it just always trips you up? And you come to a point in your life that you're just so tired of falling to the same thing. And Satan will make you think that you've fallen so many times with the same thing, you've fallen so many times that you are, un you are unreachable to God. And there was a moment in my life when I was coming back to God and God was just convicting me of the things that was happening and I just came to a point where I was just so tired. I, I felt like I had reached a point where God, where God couldn't reach me anymore and then God gave me this verse that changed me forever. Look at Psalm 66 here. Look what God says here in Psalm 66 quickly. You should get there quickly, just a few books to the right. Psalm 66, and God gave me this verse that maybe might be a blessing to somebody here or someone at home. Psalm 66, Psalm 66, look at verse 20. And if you wanna shout hallelujah after you read this verse, be more than welcome to. And the Bible says, and this is what God gave me at that moment, blessed be God who has not turned away my prayer nor his mercy from me. I needed that verse. God says, you cannot fall low enough that I can't get you if you call on me. So what I wanna do to close is we're gonna close by reading David's repentance in Psalm 51. Let's take a look. Close with this. Let's read David's repentance in Psalm 51. So you're in Psalm 66, just go a few books to the left. And this is the prayer of repentance that Psalm gave or wrote down when he had sinned, of course, with Bathsheba and Uriah. And the Bible records here the heart of David when he repented. Let's read it. Verse one. What's the first few words of his repentance prayer? Oh, What's the first few words? Have mercy upon me. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, because mercy is connected with God's loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Is, is, is David pleading for God's mercy? Is God's mercy in his hand long enough to reach even to these depths? Yes. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blame us when you judge. Let me stop and say that there are, there are things that people have done, yes, that I wanna, God notices and is taking record. God is not sitting back taking things lightly, can you say amen? Okay. But God is merciful, again, to those who truly repent. What verse are we on now here? Verse Five, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and my sin is my mother, uh, in my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness, that the bones of uh, you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Can you say amen? What a beautiful repentance. I love verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Look at this. And do not cast me away from your presence and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. I've prayed that many a times. Lord, please don't take your spirit from me. I need it to convict me. 
Verse 12, restore to me the joy of your salvation and behold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, of, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. There is always fruit to true repentance. Can you say amen? All right, verse 16, and you, uh, and you do not desire sacrifice or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. That's the true sacrifice God has always wanted. Amen. Are you thankful for God's mercy? Now here's my challenge. Do you like that? Does that make you uncomfortable? Jesus said, therefore be merciful just as your father is also merciful. Now I know there are things that happen in life and there are people and there are things that take time. There takes building of trust. There takes many things. But God is asking his people to be merciful as he is merciful. Because there are people out there who truly have done wrong and are truly sorry for their wrongdoing. Is God patient with us? Oh, what a challenge by Jesus to his people. What a challenge by Jesus to his people. After we've just seen how merciful God is, we say, thank you. God says, good. Now show your mercy to others. Uh, may God help us.